Good afternoon. At our meeting that concluded earlier today, my colleagues and I on the Federal Open Market Committee discussed overall economic conditions and decided to keep the target range for the federal funds rate at one quarter to one half percent. We judged that the case for an increase has strengthened, but decided for the time being to wait for further evidence of continued progress toward our objectives. Our current policy should help move the economy toward our statutory goals of maximum employment and price stability. I'll have more to say about our decision shortly, but first I will review recent economic developments in the outlook. Economic growth, which was subdued during the first half of the year, appears to have picked up. Household spending continues to be the key source of that growth. This spending has been supported by solid increases in household income, as well as by relatively high levels of consumer sentiment and wealth. Business investment, however, remains soft, both in the energy sector and more broadly. The energy industry has been hard hit by the drop in oil prices since mid-2014, and investment in that sector continued to contract through the first half of the year. However, drilling is now showing signs of stabilizing. Overall, we expect that the economy will expand at a moderate pace over the next few years. Turning to employment, job gains averaged about 180,000 per month over the past four months, about the same solid pace recorded since the beginning of the year. In the longer run, that's well above the pace that we estimate is needed to provide work for new entrants in the job market. But so far this year, most measures of labor market slack have shown little change. The unemployment rate in August, 4.9 percent, was the same as in January. And a broader measure of unemployment has also flattened out, a measure that includes people who want and are available to work, but have not searched recently, as well as people who are working part-time but would rather work full-time. The fact that unemployment measures have been holding steady while the number of jobs has grown solidly shows that more people, presumably in response to better employment opportunities and higher wages, have started actively seeking and finding jobs. This is a very welcome development, both for the individuals involved and the nation as a whole. We continue to expect that labor market conditions will strengthen somewhat further over time. Ongoing economic growth and an improving job market are key factors supporting our inflation outlook. Overall consumer price inflation, as measured by the price index for personal consumption expenditures, was less than 1% over the 12 months ending in July still short of our 2 percent objective. Much of this shortfall continues to reflect earlier declines in energy and import prices. Core inflation, which excludes energy and food prices that tend to be more volatile than other prices, has been running about 1.5 percent. As transitory influences holding down, inflation fade, and as the job market strengthens further, we continue to expect inflation to rise to 2 percent over the next two to three years. Our inflation outlook also rests importantly on our judgment that longer run inflation expectations remain reasonably well anchored. However, we can't take the stability of longer run inflation expectations for granted, and we will continue to carefully monitor actual and expected progress toward our inflation goal. Indeed, we are fully committed to achieving our 2 percent inflation objective. Let me turn to the economic projections now extending through 2019 that were submitted for this meeting by the Federal Open Market Committee participants. As always, participants conditioned their projections on their own view of appropriate monetary policy, which in turn depends on each participant's assessment of the multitude of factors that shape the outlook. 
the median projection for growth of inflation-adjusted gross domestic product, or GDP, is 1.8 percent this year. This figure is somewhat lower than projected in June as a result of the weaker-than-expected growth seen in the first half of the year. In 2017 and 2018, the median growth projection is unchanged at 2 percent, somewhat higher than the median estimate of longer-run normal growth. In 2019, growth edges down to 1.8 percent, in line with its estimated longer-run rate. Which, is also, which has been revised down a bit since June. The median projection for the unemployment rate stands at 4.8 at percent at the end of this year, a touch higher than in June. Over the next three years, the median unemployment rate runs near 4.5 percent, modestly below the median estimate of its longer-run normal rate. Finally, the median inflation projection is 1.3 percent this year and rises to 1.9 percent next year and 2 percent in 2018 and 2019. Returning to monetary policy, the recent pickup in economic growth and continued progress in the labor market have strengthened the case for an increase in the federal funds rate. Moreover, the committee judges the risk to the outlook to be roughly balanced. So why didn't we raise the federal funds rate at today's meeting? Our decision does not reflect a lack of confidence in the economy. Conditions in the labor market are strengthening, and we expect that to continue. And while inflation remains low, we expect it to rise to our 2 percent objective over time. But with labor market slack being taken up at a somewhat slower pace than in previous years, scope for some further improvement in the labor market remaining and inflation continuing to run below our 2 percent target, we chose to wait for further evidence of continued progress toward our objectives. This cautious approach to pairing back monetary policy support is all the more appropriate given that short-term interest rates are still near zero which means that we can more effectively respond to surprisingly strong inflation pressures in the future by raising rates than to a weakening labor market and falling inflation by cutting rates. We continue to expect that the evolution of the economy will warrant only gradual increases in the federal funds rate over time to achieve and maintain our objectives. That's based on our view that the neutral nominal federal funds rate, that is, the interest rate that is neither expansionary nor contractionary and keeps the economy operating on an even keel, is currently quite low by historical standards. With the federal funds rate modestly below the neutral rate, the current stance of monetary policy should be viewed as modestly accommodative which is appropriate to foster further progress toward our objectives. But since monetary policy is only modestly accommodative, there appears little risk of falling behind the curve in the near future, and gradual increases in the federal funds rate will likely be sufficient to get to a neutral policy stance over the next few years. This view is consistent with participants' projections of appropriate monetary policy. The median projection for the federal funds rate rises only gradually to 1.1 percent at the end of next year, 1.9 percent at the end of 2018, and 2.6 percent by the end of 2019. Compared with the projections made in June, the median path for the federal funds rate has been revised down a quarter to one half percentage point. Most participants also marked down their estimate of the longer-run normal federal funds rate, with the median now at 2.9 percent. As I've noted on previous occasions, participants' projections for the federal funds rate, including the median path, are not a fixed plan for future policy. Policy is not on a preset course. These forecasts represent participants' individual assessments of appropriate policy given their projections of economic growth, 
employment, inflation, and other factors at a particular point in time. However, the economic outlook is inherently uncertain, and any assessment of the appropriate path to the federal funds rate will change in response to changes to the economic outlook and associated risks. Finally, we will continue to reinvest proceeds from maturing Treasury securities and principal payments from agency debt and mortgage-backed securities. As our statement says, we anticipate continuing this policy until normalization of the level of the federal funds rate is well underway. Maintaining our sizable holdings of longer-term securities should help maintain accommodative financial conditions and should reduce the risk that we might have to lower the federal funds rate to zero in the event of a future large adverse shock. Thank you. I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, Steve Leisman, CNBC. Madam Chair, critics of the Federal Reserve have uh, s said that um, you look for any excuse not to hike, that the goalposts constantly move. And, and it looks indeed like there are new goalposts now. When you say looking for further evidence, and, and you suggest that it's um, evidence that labor, labor market slack is being taken up, C could you explain what for the time being means in terms of a time frame and what that further evidence you would look for in order to in hike interest rates and also this notion that the goalposts seem to move and that you've indeed uh, introduced a new goalpost with this statement. Thank you. I'll try to respond to those questions. Let me try to set out again um, how the committee sees the economy and what we're looking for. We're generally pleased with how the U.S. economy is doing. Uh, growth was weak in the first half of the year. We're seeing definite evidence that the economy is now expanding more strongly. As I mentioned, payroll gains in recent months have been solid, averaging around 180,000 per month, which is less than the pace in 2015. But as I mentioned, it's well above what's needed to provide jobs for new entrants into the labor force over time. The unemployment rate is pretty close to most FOMC participants' estimates of its longer-run equilibrium value. But, as I mentioned, that rate and other measures of labor utilization are little changed since the beginning of the year. Uh, I don't see that as bad news because it may reflect that the strong labor market is attracting people from outside the labor force back into employment. The labor force participation rates increased on balance since late last year. Um, it, has, it is on a declining demographic trend, and the fact that it's increased shows a um, substantial number of people are being attracted into the labor market. The employment to population ratio has also continued to increase. Now, we were not really certain that this is something that would happen as the labor market strengthened, and it's good to see that development has taken place, and that is some news that we have received in recent months, that the labor market does have that potential to have people come back in without the unemployment rate coming down. So we're not seeing strong pressures on utilization, suggesting overheating, and my assessment would be, based on this evidence, that the economy has a little more room to run than might have been previously thought. That's good news. Remember that inflation continues below 2 percent, although um, we expect it to move up over time. So the committee agrees that risks to the outlook have become roughly balanced. We expect labor market conditions to continue strengthening, and we are generally agreed that gradual increases in the federal funds rate to remove what is a modest degree of accommodation um, will be appropriate. But um, we don't see the economy is overheating now. Um, my my colleagues and I exchanged views at this meeting on the appropriate timing of the next step in reducing policy stimulus. Um, 
most of us judge that the case for an immediate increase in the federal funds rate is stronger, but that it would be sensible um, given the finding of a bit more running room to wait to see some continued progress, evidence that we continue to progress toward our objectives. So for the time being, we're going to watch incoming evidence, and you can see from the SEP that most participants do expect that one increase in the federal funds rate will be appropriate this year, and I would expect uh, to see that if we continue on the current course of labor market improvement and uh, there are no major new risks that develop and we simply stay on the current course. Howard. Uh, hi, uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Uh, Chair, thanks for this. I, I was wondering if you could uh, uh, comment a little bit on the, the, the apparent uh, tension between the steady drift down in the, in the long run rate uh, and the steady drift down in, in some of the projections and the seeming march toward a rate hike. If the neutral rate's coming down over time and continues coming down and you're eating up accommodation that way anyway, why not wait for the dust to settle on that before moving rates up? So it is true that our estimates of the neutral rate are coming down and that's what's largely responsible for that shift. Um, at the same time, we generally agree that the stance of monetary policy is somewhat accommodative. So 180,000 jobs a month is um, a faster pace of employment growth and is sustainable in the longer run. Now, we have seen people come into the labor force and maybe more than would be expected, which is why the unemployment rate hasn't fallen, but that's probably not something that is possible without the economy overheating on an indefinite basis. So policy needs to be forward-looking. We don't want the economy to overheat and significantly overshoot our 2 percent inflation objective. That's one risk that we need to address. And I think we generally agree that some gradual increases to remove that accommodation will be appropriate if we stay on this course. But as I emphasize, it's not that much accommodation, and the economy has shown evidence that there are more people who are being attracted back into the labor force. So uh, in that sense, I would characterize it as we found the economy has a bit more running room. Nevertheless, we don't want the economy to overheat, and um, if things continue on the current course, I think that some gradual increases uh, will be appropriate. And mainly what we discussed today were issues affecting the timing of such increases. Marty Kretzinger with the Associated Press. Uh, last month in your speech at Jackson Hole, you seemed to raise expectations that there could be a, a rate hike in September. Other Fed officials talked, including uh, Vice Chairman Fisher. They seemed to support that. Uh, 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 the Fed President Rosegren uh, had some comments that sent the markets plunging. Then we had uh, Go uh, Governor Brainerd uh, seemed to draw back. Uh, is this hurting the Fed's credibility, do you think? Uh, uh, or is this just the normal thing that we should be looking for at, at this time, uncertain time with the economy? Well, I did say at Jackson Hole that I thought the case for a rate increase had strengthened, and that um, assessment is um, included in today's statement. So I think most of my colleagues agree, agree with that assessment. Um, I think we are trying to understand some difficult issues there is um, less disagreement among um, participants in the committee than you might think listening to speeches and commentary. I think we all agree that the economy is making progress, that we are close to an unemployment rate that is um, one that's sustainable in the longer run. We all agree we are um, undershooting our inflation goal and that we want to make sure we stay on a course that raises that to 2 percent. And we're struggling with difficult set of issues about 
what is the new normal in this economy and in the global economy more generally, which explains um, why we keep revising down the rate path. And, um, you know, it's very important that in a body like ours that a whole range of views are expressed, that we have independent-minded people who gather together and uh, discuss these issues. Um, my colleagues do explain in their individual speeches their own perspectives. These are complicated, complex issues, and um, it just isn't straightforward exactly how to interpret what is appropriate policy and exactly what is going on in the economy. Um, my, my sense is that um, market participants and the public more generally learn more about the issues that we're grappling with uh, as they listen to this set of speeches. And I think it's a very good thing that the FOMC is not a b body that suffers from groupthink. And you see that, you see that's one of the, um, you know, real worries in an organization that everybody thinks identically. But there's a lot that we share in common and express both in our statement and our speeches. And we're um, debating and discussing issues pertaining to timing. John, and then we'll go to Craig. John Hilsenrath from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Yellen, uh, Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, has charged that the Fed is keeping interest rates artificially low to support the Obama administration. Uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say to that charge. And on a related note, I wanted to ask you about the Fed's next policy meeting, which is in early November, a week before the next election. Uh, given that the case for raising rates, you say today, has strengthened, uh, should the public see that November meeting as a live meeting when a rate, rate action could happen? Thank you. Well, I think Congress very wisely established the Federal Reserve as an independent agency uh, in order to insulate monetary policy from short-term political pressures. And I can say emphatically that partisan politics plays no role in our decisions about the appropriate stance of monetary policy. We are trying to decide what the best policy is to foster price stability and maximum employment and to manage the variety of risks that we see as affecting the outlook. We do not discuss politics at our meetings, and we do not take politics uh, into account uh, in our decisions. Um, as I said, we're generally pleased with the progress of the economy and the decision not to raise rates today and to wait for some further evidence uh, that we're continuing on this course is largely based on the judgment that we're not seeing evidence that the economy is overheating and um, that we are seeing evidence that people are being drawn in in larger numbers than at least I would have expected into the labor market and that that's healthy to continue, but that nevertheless, we do need to be forward looking. And if we continue along this course, it likely will be appropriate uh, to raise the federal funds rate. In November, you asked about as well, well, every meeting is live and we will uh, again assess, as we always do, incoming evidence uh, in, novem in November and uh, decide whether or not a move is warranted. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Craig Torres from Bloomberg. What observable data uh, would convince you and the committee that this um, neutral federal funds rate is starting to move up? There's a popular piece of research by one of your colleagues that suggests it's at zero right now. And second, I'm struck by your opening remarks uh, that the economy is, isn't overheating. But is, does that mean the committee sees this global reach for yield going on right now is very low cost to its policy? Thanks. So you asked first what evidence would suggest that the neutral real rate is moving up. Well, I think if you saw us revising up our growth forecast, revising down our estimates, um, well, with an unchanged path for policy, we, you know, if you saw this, you would see revisions in the funds rate path. 
but if unemployment were moving down faster than we had anticipated, if we um, saw faster growth or upward pressure on inflation, that would be suggestive of um, the appropriateness of reevaluating whether or not the neutral funds rate had, had increased. I mean, the downward revisions reflect the fact that while the economy's made a lot of progress, it's only made that progress in the context of a monetary policy that has been characterized by extremely low interest rates and negative real yields for a very long period of time. Um, let's see. And then you asked about global factors. So global factors, capital flows. Um, about the global reach for yield and whether the committee saw that as a, as a cost to its accommodative policy right now. So in most advanced nations now, we have highly accommodative policies, and they seem to be necessary um, for countries to be able to achieve their inflation and employment objectives. And that's characteristic of a, an environment in which uh, the neutral rate re interest rates both here and in advanced countries around the globe appear to be very low. And that is an environment that um, if we do have to live with that for a long time, we have to be aware that it does give rise to a reach for yield as um, individuals and um, uh, investors seek to um, perhaps take on risk or lengthen maturities to uh, seek higher to seek higher yields. And I think we should be concerned about that to the extent it creates financial stability risks. And we are very aware that those are possible. Um, we engage in regular assessments of um, financial stability factors that bear on financial stability. Overall, I would say that um, the threats to financial stability I would characterize at this point as moderate. Um, not, I mean, so I would characterize it as moderate. In general, I would not say that asset valuations are out of line with historical norms, but there are areas my colleague, President Rosengren, has focused on commercial real estate where uh, price to rent ratios are very high or cap rates uh, are very low, and that's something that has caught our attention. Um, we have a variety of tools other than monetary policy to address such risks. We've recently issued new supervisory guidance pertaining to commercial real estate. I would say in the area of commercial real estate, while valuations are high, we are seeing some tightening of lending standards and less debt growth um, associated with uh, that rise in commercial real estate prices. But more generally, we're not seeing signs of leverage uh, building up or um, maturity transformation in the way that we saw in the run-up to the crisis, and we're keeping a close eye on it. Uh, Sam Fleming from the Financial Times. Two uh, quasi-related questions. One, um, Bill Dudley uh, earlier this year suggested that uh, a political uncertainty in the U.S. may be one of the depressants on business investment at the moment. I wondered if you'd seen any further evidence that election risk was one of the reasons that businesses are holding back at the margin. Uh, second was a follow-up on your um, uh, Jackson Hole speech, where you presented a fairly optimistic uh, sense of the scope for further monetary stimulus. Um, you did raise the question of automatic stabilizers in the U.S., however. Are you concerned uh, that there is insufficient fiscal backup uh, to the Fed uh, and too much is effectively being lumped on the shoulders of the central bank if there is a fresh downturn? Thanks. Well, starting with the issue of political uncertainty and um, investment, investment spending really has been quite weak for some time, and we're really not certain exactly what is causing that. Part of it, of course, has been the huge contraction in drilling activity associated with falling oil prices, but uh, the um, weakness in investment spending extends beyond 
beyond that sector, and I'm not certain of exactly what explains that, whether I'm not aware of evidence that suggests that it's political uh, uncertainty, but um, it certainly, I would agree with the finding that it has been weak. Uh, consumer sentiment is perfectly solid. We're seeing a lot of strength in consumer spending, and consumer sentiment certainly seems to be um, solid. Um, you asked about scope for uh, further monetary policy action. Um, I was careful in Jackson Hole. Um, I indicated we have a number of tools that we've used before um, and could use again. Um, I did indicate that I do have concerns about the scope for monetary policy. Nevertheless, at this point, um, our balance sheet is large, and we're not at what we see as the um, normal level, longer run level of interest rates. So at the moment, the funds rate is very low. It's below that normal level. So at the moment, I would say the zero lower bound is a concern and we have less scope um, than I would like to see or expect us to have in the longer run. Um, now, I, I think it would, be, it would be worthwhile for other policymakers to think about what role they could play in addressing negative shocks should they come. And um, I mentioned specifically automatic stabilizers because I think that's an important way in which fiscal policy serves to cushion shocks to the economy. And it would seem to me, without getting into specifics, that uh, there are ways in which the response of fiscal policy to shifts in the economy uh, could be strengthened, which would um, help take some burden off monetary policy. Ben Applebaum, The New York Times. Uh, in, in the run-up to the Brexit vote earlier this year, several Fed policymakers cited it as a reason that they were reluctant to raise rates in June because of the uncertainty associated with that vote. In the run-up to the presidential election, I have not heard any Fed policymaker give that as a reason that they might want to delay raising rates in November. Could you explain why the Fed regards Brexit as a greater danger to the American economy than the presidential election that's actually happening here? Uh, and second, uh, there were three dissents at this meeting. Could you uh, explain what the uh, cause of disagreement was, what those policymakers uh, thought? So we are very focused on evaluating, given the way the economy is operating, what is the right policy to foster our goals. And I'm not going to get into politics. I'm just, um, the, those are factors that um, we don't consider, and I don't, I'm not going to get involved in commenting on the election. In terms of the dissents, as I indicated, um, the notion that we do have some accommodation, that if we continue on the current path, um, it's something we will need to remove over time. Um, there is general agreement among participants on that, but the precise timing of what is the right what is the right timing for removing that accommodation is something on which um, we had active discussions, and there are a range of opinions. And uh, the dissents represent um, a judgment on the part of some of my colleagues that it's important to begin that process now. Um, I certainly agree, and I've said myself, that there are risks in waiting too long to remove accommodation. Um, in, we need to take a forward-looking approach. I've always advocated um, making policy based on forecasts of where the economy is heading and um, taking account of risks. And there are two particular risk that we need to think about and balance. One is the risk that the economy runs too hot, that unemployment, the labor market tightens too much, that unemployment falls to a very low level, that we need to tighten policy in a less gradual way than would be ideal. And in the course of doing that, because that is a very difficult thing to accomplish, to gently um, create a bit more slack in the labor market, 
we could cause a recession in the process. And so that's something my colleagues and I certainly wouldn't want to be responsible for. We would um, all like to have a very long expansion with the labor market operating well for many years to come and the prospect that we could um, create, create um, downside risk for the labor market is something we would like to avoid. And taking a stitch in time might be essential to avoiding that. On the other hand, inflation is running below our 2 percent objective. And it's also important that we make sure we get back to 2 percent. And um, I have routinely indicated a number of measures of inflation expectations that are running at the low ends of their historical range, and we're watching that as well. And there would also be risks from not seeing inflation move back to our 2 percent objective. And um, exactly how to balance these two risks, which is more serious, which is a more serious risk, um, can affect one's judgment about the appropriate timing. And we're all struggling to understand the magnitude and nature of those two risks. Rebecca Jarvis, ABC News. Chair Yellen, at a time when the public is losing faith in many institutions, did the FOMC discuss the importance of today as an opportunity to dispel the thinking that the Fed is politically compromised or beholden to markets? The Federal Reserve is not politically compromised. Um, we do not discuss politics in our meetings. I can't recall any meeting that I have ever attended where politics has been a matter of discussion. Um, I think the public, if they had been watching our meeting um, on TV today, would have felt that we had a rich, deep, serious um, intellectual debate about the risks and the forecast for the economy. And we um, struggled mightily with trying to understand one another's points of view and to come out at a balanced place and to act responsibly. And that's my commitment to the American people, that I want to lead an institution that is not political and is with that we are striving to do our very best to pursue the goals that Congress has assigned to us, which are important ones of price stability and maximum employment. Does it concern you, given what Donald Trump has said at this point about the Federal Reserve, that he could go back if he were president and look at the minutes and look for signs of the Fed being politically motivated and find them? I, I have no concern that the, pol the Fed is politically motivated, and I will assure you that you will not find any signs of political motivation when the transcripts are released in five years. Um, we, I, it is important that we maintain the confidence of the public, and I do believe that we deserve it. I know that these are difficult decisions, and um, everybody may not agree with them, but I hope the public will understand that we're striving to do our best to pursue these goals that do matter to all of us. Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. You mentioned uh, commercial real estate. Are you worried that uh, bubbles could form in the economy because of our prolonged low interest rates? Yes, of course, we, we are worried that bubbles could form in the economy, and we routinely monitor um, asset valuations. While nobody can know for sure um, what type of valuation represents a bubble, uh, that's only something one can tell in hindsight. Um, we are monitoring these measures of valuation, and commercial real estate uh, valuations are high. Um, rents have moved up over time, but still valuations are high relative to rents. And so it is something we've discussed. We called this out in our monetary policy report and in other presentations. And um, we, are, we are in our supervision with banks. As I indicated, we have issued supervisory guidance uh, to make sure that underwriting standards are sound on these loans. And um, we're aware uh, this is something also that we look at in stress tests of the, large, the larger banks to um, 
see what would happen to their capital positions and to make sure that they hold sufficient capital. And of course, um, I think the soundness uh, in state of the banking system is improved substantially, but of course we are focused on such things. Chair Yellen, over here. Hi. Um, a quick question on regulation and the scandal at Wells Fargo over phony customer accounts. Um, I know that there are other regulators uh, that have looked into this, but you all are also a regulator of Wells Fargo. Have, has the Fed opened a separate investigation into this, these practices at Wells Fargo? Uh, and, and, and wouldn't you, because they do involve issues of consumer protection, uh, potentially of, of risk management and corporate governance. Uh, and uh, are, are you looking at them broadly across uh, the banking system right now? So in this specific case, um, the abuses that occurred took place in the national bank. The controller of the currency has responsibility there. And on the consumer side, um, it is the CFPB that has responsibility, but we work cooperatively and closely with those organizations. And in terms of our over, overall supervisory responsibility for Wells and other large banking organizations, we are very focused. And this will be a particular focus of our supervision. Um, going forward over the next year or so on the compliance um, environment to make sure that the controls, that the senior management oversight, that the involvement of the boards of directors um, are appropriate to control these kinds of risks. We have been distressed to see banking organizations responding when a particular problem arises um, and what we'd really want to see is robust procedures that um, ensure that employees are always acting uh, in a legal and ethical manner and that the incentives that are put in place in these organizations are appropriate and don't serve to foster um, behaviors that could harm the public. And this has been and will be a focus of our supervision. Hi, Jim Tankersley, Washington Post. Uh, over the past year, we've seen American policymakers begin to, to have maybe our most serious discussion about tariffs in the last several decades. Um, if tariffs were to be enacted uh, in the coming year or so, uh, does the Fed have an opinion on what that would do to growth in America? So, you know, that's a political issue that's currently being debated that I really don't want to get into. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to pass on that one. John Heltman. Hi, John Heltman with American Banker. Um, back to the question about Wells or related to Wells. Um, one of the concerns that has been raised, that this scandal has raised, is that the, the bank itself says it doesn't know what was happening, and there are thousands of employees that were involved in this. Um, some are calling for a breakup, saying that the banks are too big to manage. Do you think that Leaving aside the question of Wells specifically, do you think that it's possible for a bank to get so big that it can't be managed and that perhaps the best prudential step would be to break it up? So we have high expectations for what we expect to be in place in a large organization or in any banking organization. Um, we expect there to be robust systems of risk management, strong audit functions, a board of directors that is monitoring and supervising and holding senior management uh, accountable um, for things that happen throughout the organization in a strong compliance environment. And I don't think that these are impossible standards to meet. They may be challenging, but I wouldn't at this point arrive at the conclusion that just because an organization is large, it can't live up to those standards. And those are our expectations, and we intend to hold banking organizations responsible for, um, for putting in place that kind, of, that kind of 
risk management and compliance environment. So I'm not, I'm not endorsing a general conclusion that banks are, banks of that size are too big to manage. I believe they can be, but it may be challenging, and that's what we expect. Eric Shansker from Bloomberg Television. Madam Chair, thank you. I have a question about the rate trajectory the Fed outlined today in the dot plot. And while there is clearly a wide range, the median expectation is for the Fed funds target to rise by a half percentage point in 2017, three quarters of a point in 2018, and a further three quarters of a point in 2019, bringing us to two and a half to two and three quarters percent, and then two and three quarters percent to three percent in the long run. At the same time, the median forecast for GDP growth is 2% for the next two years and 1.8% thereafter. And I should add, the most optimistic projection is for growth of just 2.5% of all the projections outlined here. So if economic growth is going to be that slow for that long, where will the inflationary forces emerge that would require tightening of 250 basis points from where we are now, and if not, Inflation, is there some other explanation? So um, the projections, I agree, the projections for growth are slow. Um, we have further written down our estimate of the longer run normal growth rate. And what that reflects is an assessment that productivity growth is likely to remain low for an extended time, although it does embody an expectation that it will pick up from the miserable half percent pace per year that we have seen over the last five years. Um, now, why we would never, and, and slow growth is a factor, slow productivity growth is a factor that influences the longer run normal level of interest rates, and writing down the likely pace of productivity growth is one factor that is responsible for the downward shift in the path that you see for the federal funds rate. Uh, it, that's an important reason for revising down the neutral rate. But now let's go to your, the part of your question about inflation. Um, in spite of having such slow growth disappointing productivity growth, we have a labor market that last year generated an average of about 230,000 jobs a month, and so far this year has been generating about 180,000 jobs a month, and that is a very solid pace of job growth and a pace that likely is not sustainable in the longer run, although we've been pleased to see people come back in the labor market, so it certainly is sustainable for some further amount of time. But I think what ultimately drives inflation, both wage and price growth, is that tightness in the labor market and pressure on resource utilization. And the sad fact is that we are getting that healthy pace of job market growth with very s slow growth in output. So this is, uh, I don't think it bears on the inflation outlook. It has prompted a downward shift in the um, projected path for the neutral and actual federal funds rate. But it is a huge concern because slow productivity growth ultimately means slow growth in living standards, and that's a big concern that policymakers should be focused on. Hi, uh, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, back to Wells Fargo. Um, you know, obviously this was more of a consumer finance kind of a question, but I'm wondering if you think it does pose safety and soundness questions if something like this is widespread across a big bank. And uh, you had mentioned that this is going to be a, a supervisory focus over the coming year. Um, are, are there any adjustments that you can speak to that, that might be warranted um, given these revelations? So, as I mentioned, we are going to be focusing on compliance, risk management, and board oversight, um, not only at Wells, but also uh, across bank holding companies. Um, of course, 
um, consumer issues and issues that involve harm of consumers can become safety and soundness issues. And um, if there was uh, at least one of the lessons from the financial crisis, I think, is that abuses of consumers of the sort that we see saw in subprime lending ultimately did become um, become safety and soundness issues. And so, of course, we need to have that concern and we'll focus there. Um, I think I can't really at this point give you specifics beyond that. Hi, uh, Mike Derby from uh, Dow Jones Newswires. Uh, a large number of congressional Democrats, as well as the campaign of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, would like bankers removed from the boards overseeing the regional Fed banks. Also, other reformers would like to see the uh, private ownership of the regional, the, the bank ownership of the regional Feds ended and that the regional Feds be brought fully you know, into government. And I wanted to know what you thought of those two proposals. So. Um, we have a system that Congress did set up in the Federal Reserve Act in which the governance of the reserve banks um, involves banks uh, contributing capital and uh, serving uh, on the boards of directors. We have long recognized inside the Federal Reserve that um, when we're uh, charged with supervision of banks, having bankers involved in that obviously presents conflict of interest. And we have put in place very strong measures to ensure that those conflicts of interest are not allowed to play out in any, in any way, that bankers are not allowed to be involved in supervision. Dodd-Frank uh, changed the arrangement so that um, only the Class B and C or non-banking directors can participate in the selection of the president as well. So um, I think I want to make sure the public has confidence that in spite of the fact that we do have this banker involvement in our boards of directors, that it is not giving rise to any conflicts in our actual conduct of policy. Now, that set up, um, if, if that setup is changed, um, it raises, which it's up to Congress to decide what to do here, um, it raises complex issues about the governance, the whole governance arrangement in the reserve banks and the Federal Reserve. And I would simply caution that if that is looked at as Congress uh, is entitled to do, that they think through carefully what the ramifications of making changes would be. Karen Maracek with Market News International. Uh, you mentioned in a previous answer the need to be forward-looking, but you've also pointed to the economy not overheating as a reason you could, you know, hold off on raising rates at this one. Uh, monetary policy is traditionally operated with long and variable lags. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think this timeline has changed since the financial crisis or due to the use of unconventional uh, tools that the Fed used, and how does that factor into your decision-making? So I think the notion that monetary policy operates with long and variable lags, um, that statement is due to Milton Friedman, and it is one of the um, essential things to understand about monetary policy, and it is not fundamentally changed at all. And that is why I believe um, we have to be forward-looking, and um, I'm not in favor of a whites of their eyes sort of approach. We need to operate based on forecasts. But the global economy and the U.S. economy have changed a lot. Um, history doesn't always exactly replay itself. Um, many of the those of us sitting around the table, we learned the lesson that if policy is not forward-looking, that inflation can pick up to highly undesirable levels, that inflation expectations can be dislodged upward, and uh, the consequence of that can be uh, that endemically higher inflation takes place, which it is very costly to um, reduce. And absolutely none of us want to relive an episode like that. And so um, 
I believe, and my colleagues, that it is important to be forward-looking. We're not going to make that mistake again. But the structure of the economy changes. Things do change. The nature of the inflation process has changed, um, I think, significantly since the bad days of the 70s when the Fed had to face this chronic high inflation problem. Um, we've seen inflation respond um, less to the economy, to movements in the unemployment rate. That sometimes said the Phillips curve has become flatter, so we've seen less of a response. That's something we need to factor into our decision making. Inflation expectations appear to be better anchored, and um, perhaps that's been a result of a long period of low and stable inflation. That's an asset. It's something we didn't um, have in the 1970s. And in addition, we have to be attentive to the fact that we've now had a long period in which inflation is actually undershooting our 2 percent objective. And we see some signs that what well, I, I would conclude inflation expectations are reasonably well anchored at 2 percent. But we are seeing signs suggesting possible slippage there. And we're a long way from being facing the problems that Japan faces, but there always a should be a reminder to us that we also would not want to find ourselves in a period where um, inflation is chronically running below our objective, inflation expectations are slipping, and with the low neutral rate, that becomes more important. So things are changed, but the principle of forward-looking absolutely holds. Hi, uh, Patrick Gillespie with CNN. Uh, Chair Yellen, you just mentioned one of the economy's major problems, low productivity growth. And one of the solutions that's been proposed uh, widely is better job skills. Uh, many economists say that uh, some workers are staying on the sidelines because they don't, they, you know, they lack new job skills, the ones that would help them obtain better em employment. The Fed doesn't have the authority to finance or run its own job training program or apprenticeship. Um, but would you want that authority from Congress? And is it at all frustrating that you know, you and your colleagues know one of the solutions to fixing a major issue in the economy, but you can't take the concrete steps to solving that issue? Well, I, I do think um, job, tr job training and job skills are important. And um, we do work in community development, trying to, in the local communities where the reserve banks operate, to um, try to foster broader understanding of what kinds of programs work um, and how uh, community organizations and state and local governments can put in place programs that will be helpful. Um, I've recently visited uh, a program that was very impressive in Philadelphia. I've visited some in Chicago and other places, so I do believe it's possible to design programs that will help people overcome obstacles in getting jobs that are available. But I definitely think that, you know, while we can play some role in facilitating um, understanding of what works and what doesn't work that can be helpful, it's certainly worthwhile for policymakers at the federal level, at state and local levels, to um, be focusing on this because I think it is an area that um, would be helpful in making progress. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mark Hamrick with Bankrate.com. As we've gotten to this 4.9 percent unemployment rate, as you know, through this year's long recovery, we have yet to see substantial pickup in wage growth. And it seems as if the American middle class continues to express some disappointment about that. Is there better news on the horizon? Uh, do you think it could come in 2017, for example? And if not, when? So I think we have seen some modest pickup in wage growth. Um, it's running a little bit higher than it was over the last two years by a number of important measures. Um, and we have seen income growth pick up recently. I think the census report was encouraging, uh, showing that there are income gains both because of more jobs and higher paying jobs, and that that's occurring throughout uh, the income distribution. It's helping many families. But I do expect, we expect um, 
the unemployment rate to decline further. We expect labor market conditions to continue to improve. And my hope and expectation is that we will see some further pickup in wage growth and that it will be broadly uh, beneficial to American households. 